I worked with the Milwaukee Railroad Real Estate Department in the late 60s. And as such, I was familiar, got familiar with quite a bit of the rail in and around Seattle. And particularly uh, in the area from the uh, stadiums further south, all the way down through Auburn. And that was Milwaukee territory, basically. So tonight's uh, presentation uh, is going to share with you some of the photographs that I shot in the 70s and early 80s. And uh, so it's kind of a fun walk through history. Uh, for those of you who are modeling uh, anything from the 40s on up, a lot of these structures are small enough to fit on a layout. Here's basically the, well, this is the old uh, kingdom. And this is the area that we're going to focus on initially. And we're going to look at all of these buildings uh, in some detail. Uh, zoom in on the early part here. Um, this is the former location of the Milwaukee Freight House and offices down on First Avenue. And it's uh, right now, this is the current location of King TV. These all were all industrial buildings. This one still exists. <laughs> the trackage came through here. Uh, this is the old Stacy Street Yard, which was Milwaukee owned for many, many years until it was ultimately sold to uh, BNSF. But the trackage came <clears throat> uh, off of Stacy Street Yard here and up to the freight house. And this track came right past one of my favorite all times buildings, which still exists. And I'm gonna encourage somebody to build a model of this guy, but this is the freight house. Had four tracks along here. And uh, you should know that often uh, in these circumstances, uh, the railroad would park boxcars exactly opposite each other. And they would be able to load through the doors from all tracks uh, coming through the adjacent boxcar and uh, with little steel ramps connecting them. But the track came along here and this curvilinear feature is what's most interested me. The red outline is of that building that I'm speaking of. I identified it as the Kipper uh, building. Uh, there was a tenant there uh, by the name of Kipper uh, Seafoods and they shipped canned salmon all over the, the country from, from this location. We always called him uh, Steve Kipper, the salmon shipper. And the yellow outline here is the freight house and those tracks and on the other side of it. The interesting thing about this building is that it had an angle point in it. So it, there's two dock high doors here and each one is on one of the segments. And so you can see how their the dock was extended out to let them reach the boxcars on the curve with these uh, canopy roofs over them to help protect out some of the weather. The other thing that is very interesting to me is just the nature of the building it was clad with corrugated iron and you can see how it's weathered and so on. I think this would make a great model. Uh, we'll see another shot of it uh, a little later as we travel down the street on current Google Earth um, and it's all changed. It's all been painted and, and uh, drive down First Avenue. There's quite a bit of stuff uh, that was served by the Milwaukee uh, off of this area back here. The next area I want to talk about is the Taylor Edwards property. Taylor Edwards was a, a, a drayage company uh, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, this is Holgate Street, 6th Avenue. And the um, two buildings side by side were interconnected with bolstering truss roofs. Uh, then there's a, a cast in place concrete structure here, it was four stories tall, I think, uh, that was also part of the warehouse complex, but it was split down the middle and served from the south end. And all of these had dock eye doors, rail served on the easterly side. Um, There's an interesting property and ultimately uh, these people became clients and I ultimately ended up selling this property um, in the, uh, the mid eighties. 
And this is the Taylor Edward building, Taylor Edwards buildings today. Um, it was sold to a, uh, a company that uh, modified the building substantially by cutting big storefronts in the concrete panels here and uh, turning this into a showroom building uh, rather than a warehouse. Uh, in the interim, after Taylor Edwards uh, ceased operations there, decided to put it on the market, uh, uh, they still owned the building. Um, they moved to FedEx as one of their very first uh, big facilities in Seattle. So <clears throat> the point is that some of these older buildings have multiple uses and they can be upgraded depending on the era that you're modeling. These were typically 10 feet by 10 feet. Uh, this was also a 10 foot wide door. Truckers didn't like these doors because they were rather narrow. And uh, over the time they became pretty well beaten up on the corners here. The dock eye doors all have bumpers, rubber bumpers here. We're gonna move down to another older building, which uh, is rather fascinating. This is uh, Canal Boiler Works. Uh, they were there for many, many years. I'm interested in this building because of the interior of it. And you can see these uh, pictures here. Let me enlarge this guy. You can get a real good idea of how they, the mill, mill structure carried the overhead crane up on the craneway here. And so you had heavy columns. These are typically 14 by 14 inch solid fur posts. Mm -hmm. So the weight was all distributed straight down to the concrete and the footings down below. Uh, Canal of Boiler Works did all manner of metal fabrication. Uh, if you're going to do the interior of one of these buildings, it's perfectly appropriate to put steel on the floor. First half of the main bay of the building that was crane served had steel plate on the floor. There was roughly uh, 10 by 20 sheets of steel, about an inch thick. And the practice there was they had steel sawhorses, so to speak, and they would tack weld those sawhorses to the floor in a configuration to hold whatever big structure they were going to work on. And then the way we, they could move things around and the, the base supporting them on those sawhorses uh, was quite stable. And when they finished that product, they just cut them off and uh, ground the floor down smooth again and uh, started another project. So there's a lot of detail work that you can put inside one of these buildings. Again, corrugated iron exterior, and this is what it looks like today. So you'd have no clue as to what was here. Uh, this is a ballet school. And this was, of course, rail served on the backside. And this uh, trackage on the east side of these buildings was uh, uh, BNSF. At that time, it was uh, the Great Northern. This is the Canal Boiler Works uh, buildings right here on 6th Avenue and Lander. And we come down to Horton Street. And here again, you can see this spur track that led in off this main track down here to serve an awful lot of these additional industries. And just looking at Google Earth today, you can see from the shape of the buildings where the trackage often was, like there would have been a track along the diagonal here on this building. And the track would likely have gone over and serve this building right here. And then of course you've got structures built on these curves or storage yards and that sort of thing. Going to go back over to First Avenue and this complex right here is called Stetson Ross, a complex of buildings just north of Spokane Street. And this is um, Horton Street. Very interesting development, uh, redevelopment of these properties. In the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, Stetson Ross was a major manufacturer of logging machinery. So this is the Stetson Ross building complex. I always thought this was an incredibly interesting building or set of buildings. The sawtooth roofs with the glass on the north side. This, this let so-called northern light in, which was an, a light that was preferred by manufacturers because it was uh, not glaring and uh, led to a, a nice evenly distributed light on the floor down below. 
Uh, what is also very interesting here is the uh, the weathering on this building. It's a clapboard siding all along here and heavily weathered dock eye doors. A lot of windows are blocked off and that sort of thing. And here's the uh, another view of it, uh, give you an idea of the weathering. And you can see here the uh, detail of the, of the downspouts covering for the doors. Right here, you'll see the track for a door, or two doors actually, and the door would slide open here and open here. And then this rain gutter would protect the, uh, uh, the area from, from, uh, from rain. There's trackage along here. This corner of this building is this corner right here. And I wanted to kind of uh, show you what they, this was in its transition to this. Today, this is an antique mall. And you can see the original buildings back here. Here's the sawtooth building back here. They're all interconnected, but radically different in their, in their appearance. And this is what this looked like when it was being converted to an antique mall. You'd never know it was an industrial building, except the big windows like this sort of give it away. The next set of buildings I want to share with you are these over on First Avenue yeah. at Horton. That's the through street north of Spokane Street going east and west. And these are two buildings. I called them the Nimco properties. They were actually two different ownerships here. Uh, but I find them really interesting buildings. This one's corrugated iron cladding. This was uh, wood siding. Uh, both of them had a center bay for overhead cranes. And then the side bays were used for uh, the tool, uh, tooling areas, the machines, and so on. The center bay would have been for moving heavy fabricated um, projects around. On the, I'll show you another picture of this facility. Then I'll show you its location. Uh, here they are uh, in the uh, late uh, 70s. And, uh, and uh, obviously, they had not been much uh, money spent on them to maintain them. To the south of this building was this storage yard with an overhead crane. I shot this picture and it went back a couple of weeks later to uh, add some additional detail here. And this was gone. And they had cut these support columns off about four feet from the from the ground and just scrapped it all out. So uh, that's one of the things you got to learn about this is that things have a way of disappearing in a hurry. What year was that? This would have been in the 70s. And here you see the location of Nimco. Here's Spokane Street, it's First Avenue South. Anyway, these are very interesting buildings because they are typical larger industrial users. Uh, the two buildings here, and then that outside storage yard right here with just an immense amount of junk in it. Well, it was not junk. Those were products that were in process. And again, you can see some better detail work on this uh, spur track that came back through here. That one was on the Milwaukee, wasn't it, Russ? Uh, this would have been served by Milwaukee's over here. I'm pretty sure this is all served by Burlington Northern. This is the BNSF main line through here. Yeah, Mrs. Milwaukee over here, Northern Pacific over here. The BNSF one must be XUP. No, that's the Milwaukee. No, the one that's curvy over to the right. Oh, this? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Well, the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of these areas were uh, served by several railroads by, by uh, agreements. And some had uh, trackage rights and some other had reciprocal switching uh, rights and duties. And so uh, I'm not 100% sure that uh, the UP might have switched this at, at some point. Uh, we'll get to a little bit later to talk about East Marginal Way, uh, south of Spokane Street. Uh, that area was jointly owned, all that trackage on the west side of Marginal Way South uh, was jointly owned by all four railroads, Northern Pacific, Milwaukee, Union Pacific, and Great Northern. The Union Pacific was the ra railroad that switched that trackage. Uh, similarly, in the valley, the joint line owned by Union Pacific Milwaukee was switched by the Union Pacific. That included South Center and everything south all the way to, to uh, uh, Sumner. 
Okay, I want to go back up here. And you see this area right here. This is these at the time it was Sears. And you know what's there now? Starbucks. That's Starbucks. All of this. Very interesting structure. I got inside it when they were retrofitting it for uh, earthquake after the earthquake of 1965. I might mention that since I was at the railroad, I had the title of assistant engineer. I was basically a draftsman and, and I did a lot of leasing work and all that, but they needed, I had to have a title and they gussied it up and called me an assistant engineer. Well, we had the 1965 earthquake and the railroad got all of the engineers out to inspect the buildings. And it was my job. I inspected the Milwaukee Freight House and uh, got to see some of the earthquake leftovers, so to speak. Uh, very, very interesting light fixtures in that the offices at the freight house for the traffic department um, were these hanging uh, fluorescent fixtures that had glass lenses on the bottom and on the two uh, angled sides. The glass was like half an inch thick. The earthquake shook a lot of these loose. They came down and uh, one instance I saw where it had hit the deck, uh, the desk, big old oak desk, and it took a divot out of that desk about the size of your hand. Wow. And so I imagine the guys that were sitting in that room when the building started to shake had quite a, uh, an experience. Uh, it was not fun, but you could see the action of, of liquefaction and all that and around these buildings. And in the, uh, the basement of that building, which was like six feet high, the support structures for the floor above were big columns of fur, I'm sure, about 20 inches on a side. And you could see where the uh, liquid had been forced up at the base and uh, it had muddied up this, the base of all of these columns, uh, just like a, a soda fountain. But the point about the uh, Sears warehouse uh, that I wanted to make is that across the street here, this was a dedicated street at the time. And right here was the Milwaukee's engine house at, that served the the uh, the Stacy Street Yard, and I sold this property to Sears because the uh, they were not using this at all in the '60s. Had a, a turntable and I think a two stall engine house on it. And that sweet little sanding tower. I uh, you know the other point I want to make tonight is if anybody else has got photographs of these areas, any of these areas from the '50s, '60s, and '70s. Uh, we ought to pool them so that we've got access to them for purposes of, of model building. So we've talked about Sears and all of that. Here's Stetson Ross. Over here on the east side, the valley, so to speak, is the Rainier Brewery. This is the west side of it. And this was Doc I served. Here's the track right here. And the trackage went on up north. This is the right of way and trackage that went all the way up to King Street. And I believe it's part of the original alignment of the OWRNN that came into Seattle from the south. And that was the original access point by rail into Seattle. Uh, if you looked, all the maps showed this as OWRNN. Union Pacific. I think, was it Union Pacific? Yeah. Yeah, Oregon, Washington Railroad. And yeah, that, right. Company. Anyway, that's on the up along the alignment of Airport Way over here against the freeway. The thing I want to point about this is that, uh, you know, this was Tully's coffee for a while. I guess it's still got the Tully sign on it. But here's the main complex of the of the original brewery site. And then they had their packaging plant across the street. And there was a sky bridge here that where they handled the product over to the packaging and shipping area over here. But the other part to keep in mind is right here, was essentially a tank farm. All of these tanks were uh, basically uh, wooden staved tanks originally. And uh, uh, be a great model. I don't have any good shots of that from the street. And to the south of that, uh, in this property, was a company that uh, manufactured switches uh, and uh, points and, and frogs for all manner of railroads all over the country. Um, 
and they took uh, shipment by rail, a lot of steel product going in out. This is Columbia Street right here. So it can move on south, come over here. This is Compton Lumber site. Again, First Avenue South. And this is the first cross street beyond, first, beyond Spokane Street. Compton Lumber was here for many, many years. Crosscut Hardwoods is over here in this building. For those of you who know anything about woodworking. But Compton is on the site of the former Milwaukee Motor Transport property. And here you see the alignment of the track came in here along the backside of these buildings on First Avenue South and switched back right into here. There were two set, at least two tracks here that were spaced about 25 or so feet apart. And this was all concrete. And this is where Milwaukee in the 60s and earlier loaded trailers on flat cars. This was before dedicated equipment was designed for handling trailers. So they had originally very crude chain lash down equipment uh, to keep those uh, uh, trailers on the flat cars. The flat cars would have a, a four by four or six by, well, it'd be a four by four down each side to kind of keep them uh, pretty much in alignment. So it just depends on the era, but that this is what uh, existed there. And if you go down there today, you can still see some of the track in the concrete. Compton, of course, has now moved over on First Avenue or Fourth Avenue. We'll move on south. Marginal way south. I might point out uh, this is the joint trackage is here, all along here, and it went all the way up to this area right here, uh, to the track on the west side of First Avenue was uh, water. When I worked at the Milwaukee, this all this was water, but the Milwaukee owned the land underneath it, and so we contracted with the Mario Sagali to fill this uh, with good fill. We had an agreement that was tried to make it as ironclad as possible, that the only thing that could be put in there was class one fill, which would have been concrete and rocks and uh, sand, uh, no garbage. Um, so this was, and that was something we periodically had guys go down and inspect. But this was Milwaukee land. Uh, we used it ultimately uh, because of these shippers here. I have to say, uh, uh, Scott Stoll is online. Uh, Scott's grandfather, uh, Ed Stoll, was my boss. Uh, Ed worked and headed up the department in Chicago. And he was uh, basically mentored by a, Joe, a fellow by the name of Joe Greer, who in the, 20, in the 30s and 40s had an aggressive plan of acquiring land for industrial development. So the Milwaukee was way ahead of the game, uh, even ahead of the Union Pacific at the time, uh, in acquiring a lot of the land down the Kent Valley, where a, a number of companies exist today. Um, and of course, uh, our department was actually responsible for uh, laying out South Center and all of those buildings around 180th. I had, had a hand in working on track agreements. So anyway, there's a little bit of history in some of these old photographs. Here is off of 1st Avenue South is a very interesting building. See this North, Co North Coast refrigeration? Trackage in the street. And there's a switch back here to serve this building and the building immediately south of it. I always thought this was a very interesting structure because of the brick and all the piping. Um, out on the side here, there were like four or maybe six pipes, two inch galvanized pipe. They came out the side of the building with hose bibs or fittings on it to uh, handle material in and out of tank cars. Uh, they manufactured refrigeration components here, but they also, uh, uh, at the time that I was involved with them, were producing uh, oxygen supplies. So out front on First Avenue South was this cooling tower to handle all of the heat being generated by their process. And I thought this was an incredibly interesting structure.
because of the weathering. It's all wood. And these are louvered in their configuration so that the air would flow through this. And when it was operational, this was just a flume, a plume of fog and, uh, and uh, uh, mist going up to this out of it. Another couple of shots of that backside of that building and some of the detail. So this would make a good scratch building project. And here again, you can see the trackage turn out here and it switched back along the face of the building. The Olympic foundry here, back in the 60s and 70s, this is what it looked like. This was all a cluster of odds and ends of steel clad buildings, sort of one of those things that have been added on probably 30 times as the process has expanded right up hard against the freeway. This still exists, but it is radically different in its appearance now. This is what it looks like today. All the big, uh, dirty, ironclad buildings are gone, and most of it's out in the open, and they're not producing so much as they're collecting it by, by rail and truck and then uh, parceling out and shipping out of here. This north of here is Sunny Jim. This is Sunny Jim in the 60s and 70s. A very interesting building, but it's changed dramatically. This is what it looked like back in the old days with rail service here. This is the main line coming along the west east side of Airport Way South. This is a beautiful old uh, Spanish architectural design, brick building uh, with the uh, tile roof and all of that. And unfortunately, it had a big fire right here in the core. The rest of the buildings was fine, but they elected to go ahead and tear it down. And this is what you see today. The rail went right across the front of it here. And here is that main line. And then the track served this face of the building. But it's all obviously just truck served now. I put this in here to uh, illustrate uh, a couple of the other interesting buildings. This would make a great, basically a backdrop if you were doing an urban setting and you, and you needed some sort of a, a backdrop, but you didn't want to paint trees. Uh, this is what you'd use. Renew Ice and story, Cold Storage um, is a rail serve building on the east side of it. Quite a bit of this has been torn down now. I've got a couple other pictures of buildings. I don't, I didn't locate these on the drawings for you, uh, but just to, another couple of examples of different types of construction. These are concrete block buildings along this face. The back wall, I think, is cast in place concrete. And you can see they cast pilasters in that structure. These were all uh, cast into wooden forms in place and uh, not tilt up. The other thing I'd point out is often as buildings were being torn down, it gave me a shot at looking at the interior construction of them. And like this one is a good example of what they were, how they were configured inside with the steel trusses uh, to give you the open bay here but it's a combination of steel and wood, wood columns, I think, and uh, a steel truss on the roof. Russ, can I, uh, yeah. the two slides back now, you didn't, you said you didn't know where it was, the blue building, that's actually uh, by the West Seattle Y by sea, Seaport Steel. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, you probably uh, handled some equipment in here, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I've been I've been by there a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Here's First Avenue South Bridge and the marginal way. Uh, the track came actually down from up uh, near the Argo Yard and Union Pacific Yard and down along the west side of Marginal Way. And then at this point, it curved around underneath the First Avenue South Bridge approaches and out to marginal way and then all the way down toward to Boeing Field. Um, these are cold storage warehouses and so on. The, I found this area in here with a lot of it was rail served and you can see from the configuration of buildings uh, the evidence of the old trackage and you see a lot of these were served by tracks that came off at an angle and uh, uh, we're very, very active traffic-wise. 
this is the area of Fox Avenue. And uh, I've got a lot of pictures here, and I'm going to show you pretty quick some uh, pictures from the street of some of the tracks in the street. Um, but again, you can see from the angles on the buildings and the dimension or the configuration, like this guy right here, you can see that it was rail served and the cur track curved around the building. And here the corner of the building was knocked off to allow trackage to come along here. There was a building back here was a four story building, former Continental Can Company building. This four story concrete and build stru brick structure. It was operated by Tempris, a, a client at the time, or 70s and 80s. Tempris had a manufacturing operation there. They did the headliners for Kenworth trucks. So they had uh, two or three, maybe it was three, very, very large uh, injection molding machines on the fourth floor. And this was an injection molding machine that could do an entire cab interior in one shot. It had 12, I think, or so ports of uh, to feed the plastic material into the into the cavities and it opened like a great big clamshell to let the, the material come out. Um, the fellow Ray Asperi, the owner was a really, really interesting man. I spent a bit of time with him. But the point is the manufacturing occurred at the top of the building and then the product flowed down by gravity as it was worked on to the lower floor uh, and then the, where the shipping was. But this type of facility easily would fit on a layout because it would fit, it would take product inbound, which would be steel components, but mostly hopper cars, covered hoppers with uh, plastic pellets, uh, which would have been uh, distributed into the building uh, by piping and compressed air. So you can put hopper cars, the covered hoppers, almost any place because you can move that product around by compressed air. So now I want to share with you some of the pictures of the street trackage. Uh, it's a similar to what we looked at up and around Lake Union. But I found it interesting. There's all kinds of things here, including here a diamond um, is a turnout set of turnouts. And here you can see the controls for the turnout in uh, steel encasements. Uh, again, this is the switch mechanism for this guy. And there's a fitting over here that held the uh, switch stand underneath a steel uh, cover that would have to pry it open and and uh, throw the turnout. But what I found interesting is this trackage with the guardrails the way they are. Urban street track work, that's what you do. And for weathering purposes, this is the way, this is obvious that there are the tie play ties underneath this because that's why this is uh, weathered the way it is. As it's, it's, it's become deteriorated. The last thing I want to show you is this trackage, which is modern. This is shot about 10 years ago, I think. This is out of the Yargo yard in the Union Pacific. And this is one end of that Y where they turned the big locomotives there. Um, and uh, I found it's just a very interesting way of designating what this is. They've Obviously, you know, marked it off so that people won't park a truck there, uh, but you never can tell. Um, there used to be one of the big, uh, what, SD-70s sitting here, uh, and I've got pictures of it somewhere else. Uh, but this is, they've often would put some of the larger locomotives on the ground here because it's fairly tight curves. Greg, you would know what's the radius that they, those units can handle. I'm I'm not actually sure. <laughs> the day I, I got uh, drafted, I was walking from the bus over to the induction center, and I heard this tremendous metallic screeching. They were trying to turn a, a baby Challenger. Uh, the UP brought some baby Challengers up here. Looked like the the big ones, but not quite as big as the uh, the ones in Wyoming. And they ran the pool train down to Portland. Well, anyhow, this guy with his giant steel bar was walking along with the locomotive trying to keep the trailing truck from derailing. Yeah. And it was just howling all the way around the arc. 
some of these curves in these industrial areas, I'm sure are in the range of 10% or so. Um, I know in the 60s on the Milwaukee in the industrial areas, they finally mandated that everything had to be 12 degrees or broader. And I can't recall, it seems to me that like a 12 degree curve is something like 540 or so feet in radius. To give you an idea of what you're facing with, facing it when you're trying to do uh, scaling. Anyway, that's uh, a look at some of these older buildings. Uh, the Argo Yards right here. And that Y that I showed you the picture of is right here. And this is that turnout. So you can see how sharp this curve. This is the uh, industrial area, this big Argo yard, of course. And down here at Georgetown is the Benaroya Business Park, one of the first planned business parks in the area. And most of these buildings were rail served when they were built in the 60s. And I don't know if any of them actually take rail today. Um, one of the interesting things I know about this area here is that uh, the tail of these, this yard here is a tail track that comes down an alley right here and terminates here. So when they're switching the sand to this yard, that's their drill track basically for switching this yard comes right down an alley. That's a, a great modeling opportunity. You're talking about the background of that, uh, that brewery. And that's basically the background that's, that's for that, that lead there. Oh, yeah. Anyway, that concludes my formal remarks. I'd sure be happy to interact with you on questions. And, but use yeah, Google yeah. Earth as a resource in your model work. If you look at the Elysian Tap Room, you scroll up a little bit. You know what that used to be, that building? Right Which there. one? You have it right there. It's at the. I don't know. It says Elysian. Uh, yeah, it's a brewery now. Or it's a brewery. Oh, okay. Thing. Yeah, you're right. But there is oh, interesting. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. This is the airport there. way. Yeah. Um, this was a paint company. Mm. And um, I worked on trying to sell it, but. Uh, when I was, uh, this would have been in the early or late 70s, and it was uh, owned by a company out of Canada. It had a lot of tanks and so on here, uh, but handling uh, such sites in the early early 70s was really awkward because of the contamination issues. And this fellow did not want to to uh, fool around with the with, uh, renovating the plant and paying the money to, to do that. So he elected to shut it down. And so I, I have not looked at this for a long time, but like you say, it's a brewery now, but it was originally a paint company. I didn't realize that Cleveland High School's football field was that close to the freeway. <laughs> I wonder how many times field goals end up in the outside yeah. lane. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, the other, there's all kinds of history here. Um, Seattle, Seattle Iron and Metal. This is, of course, the uh, the big concrete processing facility with the uh, uh, material collected here. But they have the uh, had the big kilns. Were they right out here on the street? I think. And uh, the big rotary kilns and that sort of thing. Concrete cement companies were interesting because they handled tons and tons of short hoppers south of Spokane Street. Any other comments or questions, you guys? Any observations? Question. Did the UP yard have a loop for turning uh, the passenger trains out of King Street? I don't uh, think so. All this was, was just this Y. Yeah, they just did. They just Y them, huh? Yeah, well, I think they ran a lot of this stuff out of King, out of King Street. Well, no, they, the pool train would run uh, the cars in reverse, basically all the way to Tacoma. Uh, that's how they, uh, I think, turned to Hiawatha, or they turn it down at Tacoma Junction. UP and Milwaukee came out of the Union Station, not King Street. Yeah, that's this is that trackage here. 
<laughs> you know, uh, King, King Street had a coach yard for servicing. And then, of course, there was the NP commissary on 4th Avenue. But I'm wondering whether either out of King Street or the Milwaukee UP station, they, they had a loop anywhere where they turned the trains at all. I'm not aware of any loop anywhere in the Seattle area. Is anybody else? I mean, it, it was common in a lot of the cities back east. You know, they required such a great diam uh, radius. Yeah. I, when I went as a kid, I grew up in Kansas City, and I'd watch them turning the trains to the west of Union Station. And there was a great big loop there, and it was all up on a steel trestle work. Very interesting structure. Um, well, I wonder if they turned uh, any passenger equipment on that UPY, because the Y there was just about the only turn. Yeah, that's, that's the only one I'm aware of in, in the area. Yeah. Uh, kind hey, of another. Hey, yeah. Um, when you talk about that cement plant, like, around the early 70s, they, th that plant changed from bringing in cement from places like Bellingham and Tacoma and, and being a huge batch plant for construction in Seattle. And then they got the rotary kiln and started manufacturing cement. Yeah. So uh, before 1973-ish, the, the, the small hopper cars were all coming into the cement plant loaded with cement and then going out empty. Whereas after they got the rotary kiln, everything changed and they were shipping uh, cement out. And I don't even, yeah, they must be still shipping cement out because there's still a lot of those uh, short hopper cars there. So they must, they must ship cement now that they make their two other constructions, the batch plants around the Northwest. They do. They're a major supplier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but can it, you go it, back where you were? About right in here someplace in World War II, there was an outfit called Fry Packing Plant, a big meat packer. So it was on the side of the hill. And uh, God darn it, I can't remember now. It was either a B-17 or B-29. One of the oh, yeah, ones. it crashed here. Yeah, it was a 29, wasn't it? The early I think it was a 17. Okay. B-17, it crashed right there and they killed a bunch of people. Yeah. The only other thing I'd, uh, I remember about the waterfront, well, the Milwaukee owned a pier here. We had a barge operation here. We had uh, uh, Wells McCurdy, uh, a very wealthy fellow. I think he was with one of the operators. <sighs> Boy, I could be incorrect. I think he was involved with Puget Power, Puget Sound Injury. Anyway, he had a, an, a, a private car, a beautiful observation car painted Union Pacific colors. And he stored it out there. And um, he had to move it so that the Milwaukee uh, took it down to Stacy Street and um, stored it there. Well, unfortunately, one of the guys in charge of looking after things there sort of fell asleep at the switch. And they had an issue with the steam pipe to heat the car, uh, basically got out of control and steam heated the inside of that car entirely. Mm -hmm. And all of the woodwork and so on oh, was basically steamed off the walls. Oh, no. Uh, well, Wells was not very happy. Russ at Milwaukee uh, barge uh, dock was almost straight west of Sears. Okay. Yeah, that 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 sort of it would have been in here. So in here, I think that's right. It's in here somewhere. Here's the Sears building. This uh, Sears property handled an incredible amount of traffic. It was like eleven hundred cars a year. Uh, a great deal of that material went to Alaska out of this Sears store. This is how they distributed all their stuff to Alaska. There used to be, when I was a kid growing up, I remember a uh, super uh, long wooden footbridge that would go across uh, the railroad tracks from the Sears store over to the waterfront. Yeah, and it was right here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, me too. 
that had to be like into the 80s didn't it i think i remember that bridge being there yeah mm -hmm. so again uh take advantage of google earth because uh, uh you can get some really interesting stuff um for instance here come down to street view and uh, this is a classic this is these were rails served on the back side is that funus and o'neill that the furniture store uh, i don't know that you're talking about the big building here yeah yeah they used to have i don't know but i know ob williams um they're one of the oldest companies in seattle for millwork and they have cutters that custom designed for every shape you want to ever mill on wood. Mm -hmm. uh, I just bought some stuff for them to uh, redo the base of my kitchen island. And it's, it's an old, old time structure, wooden floors in a lot of it. Photoshop, you can take a building like this, even though it's off at an angle and you pin the two corners or four corners in the photograph and remove the parallax, so to speak, and uh, end up with a facade that you can scale uh, for building a model. So get familiar with the Photoshop and Google Earth. How far back in time can you go with Google Earth? Well, certainly back in the early 80s and maybe the mid mid 90s. On their thing here that goes back to 85. Some places it goes back even farther, like the 50s, and depends on the area. Like Mount Vernon, you can go back um, quite a ways and see things. So it just kind of depends on the area. I think some of it has to do with satellite imaging, and some of it is like airplanes. Yeah. This is, of course, the crossing of the Duwamish over to Harbor Island or to uh, Ch Terminal 5. There's a bascule bridge here that's usually up. This is an old steel company fabrication facility. And I worked with the owners who bought this and converted it into a, a, a essentially a movie and, and entertainment studio for recordings and so on. Very, very interesting complex. But south of here, along West Marginal Way, is the another cement plant. Ideal cement. Yeah, ideal. I'm not sure how far south it is. I don't think it's very far at all. Because the trackage serving it is incredibly little short, stubby spurs. Uh, they, you know, I put uh, eight or so cars on each track because you're handling he very heavy loads. But there's not a heck of a lot of stuff on the west marginal wayside, a lot of open areas here and so on. And this is the First Avenue South Bridge, of course. Isn't that cement plant called something else today? Like Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wonder what that vessel right there is. This guy? Yeah. That's a bulk a... bulk carrier with the uh, open with well, a covered base. There's a loader on here that I think that moves back and forth. Wow. Didn't know we had anything like that in Seattle. That's way cool. This is what it looks like today. Yeah, here's this loader. Yeah, the, one of the tough things about this uh, area is that uh, a little further north, of course, was uh, the location of Seattle Iron and Metal. And uh, in the Second World War, they shipped several of the narrow gauge locomotives from Colorado up to Alaska to help with the traffic on the uh, White Pass and Yukon. When the war was over, they shipped many of them back down to Seattle and they ended up here at uh, Seattle Iron and Metal and uh, got scrapped out right here. I saw one in the hold by looking over the end of the pier, uh, side of the pier, uh, right in mid Seattle. I don't know what pier that would have been, uh, but you well, know, right of, about just, possibly at the north end of Harbor Island. Uh, I wasn't down there. I know I was on the, I was on my lunch hour on the Seattle waterfront. So it was down about where the Coast Guard uh, anchors now. Oh, Pier 24? Yeah, or right Slip around 24? there. Right around there. Yeah. I never saw them offload it, so I don't know if that was. 
Yeah, a little 280. Yeah. Anyway, they didn't uh, didn't make it back. Um, well, Russ, uh, thank you very much, Russ. That was an outstanding clinic. Loved it. Just loved it. Now, we got to keep doing these kind of talks more with all you guys that have gone and done this research and know some of these companies. It's really useful. I didn't I'll tell you, the memory, as, the memory fades real fast. I didn't think of it as research. I was just trying to get outdoors during my lunch hour. <laughs> <laughs> So Russ, I, I have kind of a personal question for you. Yeah. When 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 was your last year with the Milwaukee? I left the Milwaukee in '69, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, Ed uh, transferred me back to Chicago, <laughs> and uh, gave me a two hundred dollar a month raise and a title change, <laughs> and that was the that was the the mechanism back then. And I, I called up and I told my boss at the time, Bill Bobbitt, I said, Bill, I'm moving back to Seattle. And he says, we well, can't do that. I said, why not? I says, because we've already filled your position. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that, you know, that's a typical old tactic. I said, that's fine. Um, you've lost an employee. <laughs> and he says, you don't want to quit now because we're going to have a recession. <laughs> Watch me. <laughs> Part of no, I, I left, you know, well ahead of the time of the demise of the, of the road. It was too bad. The, uh, I have to say the atmosphere in the Seattle office was incredibly nice. Um, it was collegial. We, everybody know everybody. And, um, uh, it was very, very comfortable. So that was a hard environment to think about leaving. And um, was that still in the old Skinner building at the time? Yeah. Okay. The, well, no, no, the White Henry Stewart building. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. After uh, I left, they moved the offices over to the Skinner building because they tore the building down. And that's where the big Grenier Tower is. Okay. Well, if, uh, if there's no more uh, questions or uh, any kind of discussion, I'd like to move on uh, to the next part of our program. Uh, is there anyone out there that would like to uh, either show off or talk about uh, any model? Yeah, I've got something I'll share that I okay. did recently. Saw an article in the um, Mainline Modeler back in the 90s by uh, Clint Crow. A lot of you guys know Clint Crow. Yeah. Uh, it was on making a, a form. This is strips of balsa wood. It made his form, cast a master in plaster. And, and this is to simulate a uh, concrete wall with, uh, you know, made with, cast with uh, wooden boards for the form. It's really hard to see the, the texture uh, I mean, if I change it in the light, you can see some of the, the texture of the boards. I bought some silicone RTV and I made a mold. So I can cast as many of these as I want. The castings, you can't tell the ta casting from the master plaster, the, the mold is that good. So I haven't, I haven't cut these up yet to actually build them. This is a new adventure of me making the, uh, making the uh, RTV molds. And um, turns out it's one of those things that you, uh, you make that step to actually set your fears aside and, and actually jump in and do it. And it turns out it's, it's actually pretty simple. The technique I did is I, I, I wasn't sure how much to mix. Calculated the volume and I divided that by two. And then I put a, uh, a mixing cup on my little digital scale and zeroed it out. This is a, the mixing cup was, uh, was graduated. It was calibrated. So I had calculated half the volume and I poured part A in up to that line for half the volume. 
and I looked at the weight on the scale, wrote that down, zeroed the scale again, and then took part B and poured it in until I got to that weight. So that meant I had equal weight. And um, this these two-part stuff could be mixed by weight or by volume. And so I, with the scale like that, it was uh, pretty easy to do it by weight. And it was probably more accurate than trying to read the, the graduations on the side of this uh, graduated mixing cup. And then mix it up and poured it out. And um, took a couple of hours to cure, but uh, pretty easy. And uh, I'm surprised. I'm waiting for an opportunity now. I have some casting resin. Um, I don't have a project in mind right now, but uh, I'm going to try casting some resin one of these days. Did you have to coat your uh, form, your original wood form? Oh yeah, the the form, the form. Um, well, first of all, this is one eighth inch by sixteenth inch balsa wood, and um, I gave it two coats of uh, sanding sealer, and then I a uh, coat of uh, Vaseline dissolved in um, mineral spirits paint thinner. Um, and that, that's what uh, that's what Clint recommended in his article. And this one, this is the second one I made. The first one uh, was destroyed when I took the master out. Uh, the second one survived, but you really only need to use it once because once you get the master and then you make the mold, then you can make as many as you want. And with Hydrocal, you can turn these out about one every 15 minutes. Some of you have seen my layout, and this is at my area called Bunkers. And this is when it's under construction. And so I've got a, um, a trestle going across the Y here. And you can see here on the, uh, on the detail of this bulkhead that I cast, and I, that's the way I did that. Mm. This is the way, and you get this texture, and it's irregular as all get out. They typically would use one by eight uh, ship lap on these forms with one by sixes. So this, this space would no, not be any longer than 10 inches, maybe 12 inches, maybe, but most likely it would be um, eight inches or so. And then you need to space the ends periodically, like right here is an end. And you want these to be staggered because they would have braced this with with vertic vertical wood members um, as they uh, uh, to hold a form in, in shape when it was being uh, filled with concrete. Yeah, when I when I did my uh, master, um, it's a little hard to see, but uh, um, I used increments of four scale feet. Yeah. So the so the joints all they're staggered, but they but they line up at four foot intervals. And that was four foot was just an arbitrary number I picked it. Well, yeah. keep in mind early buildings had stud walls on twenty four. Uh, uh, well, sixteen inch center, but more earlier ones were were twelve inch on center. Oh, really? And often they were the original buildings were like two by sixes for stud walls, and then after the Second World War, they got really cheap and they started using two by fours went to a 16 inch center. And um, that's a very typical increment. And then in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, they've gone to 24 inches uh, with some of these precast components. Well, is there uh, anyone else that wants to talk about any modeling projects? This is, uh, cool. this is the, last, the last building on my layout I'm working on. It's the South Seattle also. This is uh, near Spokane Street and Colorado Avenue. It's now Maxim Petroleum. It used to be Rainier Petroleum. Uh, getting close to finishing it. So that's, that's what I'm working on. Uh, Greg, cool. did you uh, work uh, as an engineer or a switchman in that area? Yeah, as an engineer. Okay. The, the area that I, that I model is all... Uh, it's all down out of Stacy Yard, so. But more modern, 
So I, I don't know much about uh, past except for what you just said. And one other thing I want to say, that first building you mentioned, that Kipper building. Yeah. Uh, that That's the building I've always, like, you said it was one of your favorites. That's one of my favorites also. Uh, I am. Um, I was real disappointed last time I went up there and noticed that it was painted because of the the way it, it looked when it was all weathered and, and rusted. It was great, you know, so. Yeah, it's been pretty spiffified. The yeah. south <laughs> wall of that building is brick. And when uh -huh. we had the 65 earthquake, the top 10 feet or so of the brick wall came off. And so when it was rebuilt, you can see the differentiation in the tone of the brick and color. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. You have a couple of pictures of uh, my recent river project I can share. I recently finished pouring uh, what I call the Wainichi River um, on my layout. Uh, Russ referred to it as a, as a signature scene. And I guess you could say that. <laughs> it took a lot of work and actually about uh, 20 ounces of, um, of magic water to get it done uh it's quite a bit of uh quite a bit of resin uh as i did it in about four batches or actually about six batches but um you guys can kind of see i've got it braced up here so it doesn't start to, uh doesn't push my dam out and start running down the front of the layout just mm -hmm. you know uh something i really enjoyed building and and uh i'm not done with it yet i need to put things like guardrails on the bridge and and do some more vegetation around and, and I'll do some texture on the, uh, on the top of the resin when it's after it's cured and what I, after I decide what I want to do. Larry, where did you get your uh, photography for the backdrop trees? I took that in panorama mode with my iPhone 12 pro max. Okay. I went down to uh, Gray's Harbor, uh, went out by the Wainichi river, actually, uh, the actual Wainichi river just took pictures and I was, I actually tried to um, use Photoshop elements to create a panorama. And I was having a devil of time with that. And then I happened to think, you know what? I got panorama mode on my phone. I wonder what that's going to look like. And so I stood out there with my phone and just kind of moved it around. And I took panoramas. I got some pretty good, uh, actually got some pretty good material out of that. So who printed them up for you? Uh, some of you guys will know Mike Sleese. He's the sure. um, yep. he's the chair of the Fourth Division Modular Group. He's Sir also Speedy. the owner of Sir Speedy uh, yep. in Tacoma, and they do signs and they do uh, you know things like that. And uh, this is actually printed on like three millimeter uh, PVC, um, and it can be printed up to eight feet wide. Is this a standalone backdrop then? Yeah, the backdrop is, um, like I said, it's printed on three millimeter PVC. So it's, I can actually, when I went down to get those, I actually flexed them into the, uh, into the cab of my Ranger pickup. And the resin is actually tinted with, with a combination of red dye, green dye, and black India ink. And so, and that, all that stuff's available through uh, Scenery Express. Tyler Whitcomb, who some of you guys know, is an excellent end scale modeler, actually told me to use Magic Water. He said that's the product that he recommends. And if you've seen his layout, you've seen some really nice modeling of water. And one of the other things I did on the bottom was it's got sifted paving sand, and I tinted and I put the the black India ink in there. I took a, a ceramic coat a terracotta color paint, and I dribbled that over the that paving sand or yeah, play sand or paving sand um, as well. So that it kind of tinted that with a more brown color on this. This is the same material, right? Right up here, the sifted or the paving sand It's actually not sifted, but it's the paving sand on this one, because I wanted it brighter. I actually went over and dribbled um, pale gray over the top of it. This is a picture of it when I was actually, after I put down the paving sand, it hadn't quite dried, but you can see over on the right, there's a really dark area. Um, and that's where the India ink went in. And then the more orangey or brown area over here is the terracotta. 
And then Tyler also said to do a uh, matte medium uh, around the edges of it. And that keeps the uh, epoxy from climbing the edge of your, of your area that you have it in. So kind of, otherwise it'll climb the shore and sometimes it can climb like an inch and a half. Thank you very much for showing us your techniques. That was awesome. Yeah, that was really cool. Yep. That was very cool. Glad you guys uh, enjoyed it. So I hope that uh, until next time, I hope that everybody stays safe, stays healthy, and uh, hope everybody out there has fun with mall railroading. So I'll see you guys uh, next month and uh, take care.